Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Read Uncle's Dream by Theodore Dostoevsky. This is an audio presentation of the novel, with occasional clarifying commentary from me, the reader. Now, if you want to jump straight to the action, feel free to skip ahead to the next video in this playlist. To access the playlist itself, check out the video description below. Otherwise, stick around, and I'll explain the nature of this project a bit further while providing some background material on the story. The basic purpose of this Let's Read is to make the literature as accessible as it can be in an audio format. Typically, when you read classical literature in print, you have a host of advantages that you do not have in a conventional audiobook. You might have an introduction from a literary scholar. You may have notes that provide relevant background information that would tend to be lost on a modern audience. You have time to sit and absorb complicated developments in the plot, or to sort out a complicated cast of characters, and so on. In a conventional audiobook, by contrast, you simply get the spoken text rolling on. But not in this audiobook. Here I wish to read through the novel with you, but will retain the license to add comments where I think it may be helpful to a general audience. In just a moment I will provide some introductory background information on the novel. When completed, this Let's Read will also contain some concluding thoughts on the book, but it will also have some notes sprinkled throughout the reading, simply to clarify points that the average listener could easily miss. I will do my best to keep a light hand, and to allow the text to stand on its own. But there will be cases where it will be useful to sum up events or to identify references, and so you will be hearing my comments every so often, just to make sure you don't get lost. I will reserve my own analysis and reactions to the text for the final video of this sequence. Now, I expect to complete this project in two formats. Currently, you are viewing this Let's Read as part of a YouTube playlist, and I will start making these videos available to the public when I am a little over a third of the way through the recording. However, in the end, I expect to assemble all the parts of this Let's Read as a single video for the benefit of search engines outside of the YouTube environment. If that's your preference, expand the description below, and you will likely have a link to that single video. If you are keeping it here, our next item of business is an introduction to the novel itself. First off, Uncle's Dream is in the public domain. The version we will be reading has been translated by Constance Garnett. The Garnett translation is particularly difficult to find. The Frederick Weishaw translation, by contrast, is all over the Internet and is used for the LibriVox recording. I have no problem with the Weishaw translation, but for the purpose of continuity with other Let's Read projects I've completed, I wanted the Garnett translation. Ultimately, I found it in a mid-20th century volume entitled The Short Novels of Dostoevsky, which has an introduction by Thomas Mann. There is a mostly legible PDF version of this anthology available for download at archive.org, although I'll warn you that it does have a couple of pages missing. In the end, I discovered that interlibrary loan is a lovely thing. In this volume, the novel spans about 120 pages. Uncle's Dream has been referred to as Dostoevsky's second debut. It was written in the late 1850s and published in 1859, and it was the first fictional work of his to be written after his release from prison in Siberia. In fact, he was still serving mandatory military duty in Siberia when he was writing, and his name had not appeared in print for ten years before it was finally attached to this little novel at the end of the decade. 
The origins of the story are a bit unclear. There is some reason to suggest that it may have originally been intended as a play. In the early stages of the novel, the narration shifts its verb tense, at one point offering present tense description almost like the blocking directions of a play, before settling into a more conventional past tense narration. A full dozen of the book's fifteen chapters take place in a single day, with only occasional changes in scene, and the bulk of the story is carried by dialogue. We could easily imagine a stage adaptation of Uncle's Dream, although ultimately Dostoevsky settled on the form of the novel, which is what he knew best. In fact, he wrote Uncle's Dream at roughly the same time as he was writing another short novel, entitled The Village of Stepanchikovo, sometimes called The Friend of the Family. Both of these works are pitched in a comic tone, and both were composed with the aim of getting his name back into the literary mix while garnering some much-needed cash, all without raising the suspicions of the censor. Indeed, since Dostoevsky had been arrested on political charges in 1849, and since he was just emerging from the subsequent years of hardship, he could not afford to take chances by pursuing controversial subjects. Each of these works was a safe project, which is what his circumstance demanded. It was not what the reading public of the time demanded, however. By the late 1850s, the Russian intellectual focus was on the ascendancy of the new Tsar Alexander II, the promise of the emancipation of the serfs that was just around the corner, and the question of social and cultural progress. Estranged from the intellectual climate of the time while still in exile, Dostoevsky published works that were mostly silent on these topics, and so both Uncle's Dream and The Village of Stepanchikovo were mostly ignored by the public. There was one notable exception to this. In 1863, a literary critic by the name of Chernyshevsky would publish an influential novel entitled What is to be Done? This work was at the center of the Russian literary scene, and it is widely recognized to have been a primary stimulant of Dostoevsky's first great work, Notes from Underground. But some scholars have noted that Chernyshevsky seems to have borrowed various characters and elements of his plot from Uncle's Dream. And so Dostoevsky's second debut may have had one notable reader after all. Yet Chernyshevsky was an outlier. Most of the literati ignored this work, along with Dostoevsky's other Siberian novel. With the passage of time, many critics have come to the conclusion that the snub of The Village of Stepanchikovo was unfair, that the second of Dostoevsky's Siberian novels is an underappreciated work. Rather few critics through the generations, however, have had much praise for Uncle's dream. Dostoevsky himself wrote it with distaste and never changed his opinion of it. I don't like it, he confessed, and it saddens me that I am forced to appear in public again so miserably. Being a needy writer is a filthy trade. Unquote. For my own part, I think the negative reaction to Uncle's dream is a bit overblown. This is not great literature, but it is an enjoyable light read, and it contains at least one particularly interesting character which I'm not sure the pre-Siberian Dostoevsky would have been capable of drawing. The story of Uncle's Dream is set in a backwater provincial town, where a wealthy, foolish, and enfeebled old man, with a lengthy career as a dandy, finds himself for a brief visit. As he is unmarried, he makes an admirable target for the ladies, who vie for the prize of having a wealthy widow in the family, 
and thus a path to increased social status. Complicating this scenario is a love triangle, or quadrangle, concerning a beautiful young woman who is admired by two local young men, but whose mother wants her to marry the rich old dandy. Cue the shenanigans. The general tenor of the work is comedic farce. This is not the first time Dostoevsky has ventured into this territory. Most notably, the 1848 story, Another Man's Wife or the Husband Under the Bed, was pure low-brow vaudeville. But Uncle's Dream has a bit more going on than that earlier work. The story is dominated by a character named Maria Alexandrovna, one of the town's prominent society ladies, who exhibits masterful command over the social scene and is able to exercise control over everyone around her. The sort of arguments she musters to bowl over her opposition can operate as an object lesson in the powers of sophistry. In this regard, she is probably eclipsed by the villain of Dostoevsky's other Siberian novel, Foma Fomich, from the village of Stepanchikovo, and yet she is remarkable in her own right, and there is no one quite like her in the earlier works of the author. The passage also contains a bit of social commentary under the layer of farce, the story is told via an unnamed narrator who puts on an ironic tone, even labeling his manuscript with the subtitle From the Annals of Mordasov, as though he is offering an important history when he is really just gossiping about the petty maneuvering of a pack of busybodies in a provincial town. Through his tone, we get a picture of the shallowness of some among Russia's upper classes, and indeed their callous insensitivity on one topic in particular, the institution of serfdom, which Dostoevsky despised. Further, on occasion, the ironic tone of the narrative is arrested by a startling moment of sobriety, where Dostoevsky is doing more than just poking fun. Another part of his aim appears to be to comment on the nature of art and ideas and the way they shape values and culture. There is a bit of satire here on the romantic and westernizing values of the upper classes of his time. I'll say a bit more on this topic in my concluding comments. Finally, before we begin, I need to attend to three items of housekeeping. First, as this story is populated by upper-class westernized Russians, the characters will often slip into French, or even German, as they are speaking. It would be tedious to stop and provide a translation for every expression in a foreign language, but thankfully, with the medium of YouTube, I won't have to. Rather, I will simply provide the translation visually on screen without stopping, at least for the first occurrence of the expression. I may not do so for every occurrence of a phrase that is often repeated. Second, I should say just a word on Russian naming conventions. Russian names have three parts, a first name and a surname, but in between the two, a patronymic, which contains the first name of the individual's father, followed by a vich or an ovna, depending on the sex. Sometimes the character will be referred to by his last name, sometimes by the first name and patronymic, and sometimes by the first name alone, or by a nickname. So, as an example, the full name of one of the principal characters of the novel is Zenaida Afanasyevna Moskalev. That is, Zenaida, daughter of Afanasy, of the Moskalev family. Her father is Afanasy Matveyich Moskalev. In the formal mode of address, she will be referred to as Zenaida Afanasyevna, but she will often be referred to informally as Zina or Zinochka. Third, 
while we are on the subject of names, this work has a dizzying array of named characters for such a brief novel, and this feature is only complicated by the fact that the uncle of the story continually gets characters' names wrong, multiplying the number of names that appear in the text. So I thought it would be useful to have a dramatis personae of the most important characters for your reference. There is, of course, our unnamed narrator, a self-styled chronicler of the annals of Mordasov, who informs us at the outset that he is telling the story of the downfall of a particular family from the height of social power in the town. That family is the Moskalev family, which is led by its matriarch, Maria Alexandrovna. Her weak and dull-witted husband is Afanasy Matveyich. Their daughter is the beautiful and very eligible Zinaida Afanasyevna. Zina is the romantic ambition of three men. One of them is the young and somewhat wealthy Pavel Alexandrovich Mosgliakov. Mosgliakov is a distant relation of the elderly and fabulously wealthy dandy whom he calls his uncle. That man's first name is Gravila, although he is typically referred to as Prince K, and he swiftly becomes the center of attention in Mordasov. Finally, there is a poor school teacher who is mostly relegated to the background, but who was at one point romantically involved with Zina, and whom we come to know only as Vasya. Beyond these figures, there is a veritable army of society ladies vying for social supremacy in the town. Two of them in particular figure as Maria Alexandrovna's chief rivals, Anna Nikolaevna Antipov, the wife of the public prosecutor, and Natalia Dmitrievna Paskudin, who has one of the finer houses in the town. These two ladies are talked about frequently, although they don't appear on the stage until late in the story. A third rival does not appear on the stage at all. Her name is Stepanida Matvievna, who serves as Prince K's caretaker and the steward of his estate. Maria Alexandrovna is keen on prying the prince away from Stepanida's clutches. A more significant presence in the plot proper is made by one Nastasia Petrovna Zyablov, a widow in her thirties who lives in the Moskolov house. Then there is an eccentric older lady named Sofia Petrovna Karpuhin, the wife of a colonel, who apparently is something of a social outcast. Finally, down the stretch, we encounter a particularly vicious society lady named Felisata Mihalovna. And there are still more among their number, although the others do not deserve mention. This roster represents at most half of the characters in the little novel. A complete roster would have to include the local doctor, a Jewish pawnbroker, the provincial governor, a monk from the nearby monastery, the true nephew of Prince K, a man who might be Anna Nikolaevna's lover, a couple of teenage girls, the number of servants, the multitude of people referred to in the prince's anecdotes, and even more. But the figures enumerated so far are sufficient to get on with. The Moskalev family, the three suitors, and the half-dozen society women just mentioned. You may want to come back to this list as a reference later on. But for now, we are ready to begin. So sit back and enjoy Uncle's Dream. <laughs> 